Hello guys, welcome to another session for our ARD section for our Nobart exam. And for today's video, I've chosen a topic on horticulture, which is a continuation of the part one. In the previous video, we've already talked on the till the production technology of the food crop. So we're, today we're just gonna continue off with this a little bit, right? And please don't forget to subscribe and please press the bell icon for further notifications. And if you like the video, please don't forget to hit the thumbs up button as well as share with your friends. All right, so the, here today we're gonna talk, start off with our vegetables. So what is a vegetable? A vegetable is an edible pod, which is usually a succulent plant or a portion, or it is eaten with a staple as well as a main course, or as a supplementary food in cooked or in a raw form, right? And classification of vegetables, we've already talked about the classification of the horticulture crops, but this is particularly mostly for the vegetables, right? And for vegetables, we can uh, classify them on the edible part. And there are different parts of plant which is edible. And on that basis, these uh, crops or these vegetables are grouped into these particular categories. So the first one here is on fruits. And for fruits, we have cucumbers or the cucurbits. The cucurbit family will come under this fruits. And we have eggplant, we have okra, pepper, pumpkin, snap beans, we have tomatoes, chilies. All of these will come under your fruit, right? And for the seeds, all the pods, we have your beans, you have your peas, corns, and lentils, all right? And for flowers, artichoke, broccoli, uh, and cauliflower. Stems, we have your fennel, asparagus, celery, cold rubby. Cold rubby is also known as the no Leaves, where you only use the, uh, the leafy part of the uh, plant here we have your bok choy, your mustard, your lettuce, spinach, turnip greens, your Chinese cabbage, Brussels sprouts, beet greens, watercress, turnip cress, parsley. All of these will come under your leafy vegetables. And for tubers, we have your ginger root, potatoes, the sunchoke, which is also known as the Jerusalem artichoke. And your roots will be your beetroot, carrot, turnip, radish, potato, um, sweet potatoes. We have your parsnip and your celery root and bulbs. We all know we have your onions, your chives, leek, shallots and garlic will come under your bulb, right? So on the basis of a soil tolerance to the soil reaction is basically on the acidity. These uh, crops or these vegetables can be classified into three categories that is slightly tolerant, moderately tolerant, and very high tolerant. So, uh, the crops which come under slightly tolerant are broccoli, cabbage, cauliflower, bhindi, spinach, let leek, Chinese cabbage, lettuce, asparagus, muskmelon, and onions. And for your moderately tolerant crops would be your um, Beans, carrots, cucumber, brinjal, garlic, pea, tomato, radish, turnip, Brussels sprouts, no coal, and pumpkin. Very high tolerant crops, potatoes, sweet potatoes, watermelon, rhubarb. And it can also be classified on the basis of your salt tolerance. On the basis of salt tolerance, it can be categorized again into three categories, which is sensitive, moderately tolerant, or moderately resistant, and resistant. Or tolerant. So the sensitive crops towards salt are pea, beans, radish, potato, brinjal, sweet potato. Moderately resistant would be onions, carrots, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, tomatoes, melons, and chili. Right. And resistant uh, to tolerant would be your asparagus, beet, lettuce, bitter gourd, and ash gourd. So these are the basis of classification of these vegetable crops. Right, so moving on, we're going to move in detail with each of the crop. I couldn't cover all the important points, but whatever important points I have highlighted here in this slide, right? So tomatoes, we have the scientific name is Lycopersicum escalantum, and it is native or it's originated from Peru, and is a warm season crop, but it can be grown in all seasons. Places where the temperature goes about for more than 25 degrees Celsius to say about 40 degrees Celsius, it can be grown in the winter season as well. So usually the ideal temperature would be from 25 to 30 degrees Celsius. Uh, the night temperature would range about 18 degrees Celsius to 15 to 18 degrees Celsius, right? So these are the ideal temperature for the growth of tomatoes. 
then according to this temperature it can be grown in all seasons of uh, in the year so the red color in tomatoes is caused by a compound called lycopene remember this it's important right and the popular varieties are arca ruby arca vicas and this punjab chuhara it is a determinate variety of a tomato so right and seed rate if we're going to talk about seed rate we have two types of seed rates so normally we have a normal seed rate which can be which is not of not a hybrid and, and a hybrid which needs a lesser amount of uh, seeds right for seed rate so normal seed rate is about 350 to 450 gram per hectare and for hybrid hybrid we only need about 100 to 150 gram per hectare and to remember this it's a day neutral plant and it is a self-pollinated plant so BR, which is also known as the blossom and rot, it is caused to the deficiency of calcium and the fruit cracking. It is caused to the deficiency of boron as well as fluctuation or in the high moisture content. All right. And here in this, I've given a picture of this fruit cracking. The first one is a fruit cracking, which is caused to the boron. As you can see, the uh, symptoms is clearly visible in this picture where the fruit is cracking. Right. So in certain cases, in uh, very uh, extreme cases, this food crack, the ooze or the inside material will come out oozing out from the crop, from the uh, food as well. Right? And here blossom and rot, usually it attacks the end or the end part of the fruit, right? So here, a lesion is formed on the end or the bottom part of the fruit. So the most common pest here in tomatoes, uh, tomato is fruit borer, which is also known as Helicoverpa armigera, right? And the leaf curl, leaf curl is, is a disease which is caused by virus where the leaves or of the <coughs> of the tomato plant it curls inwards, right? There'll be crinkling, fluoresces will also happen, will also happen, yellowing of the leaves can back up with the yellowing of the leaves and fluoresces as well. The vector or the one which transmits this virus is white fly. Let's go to our brinjal. Brinjal, the scientific name is Solana melongina, which belongs to the family Solanaceae, and it's native to India. And the pigment which is responsible for the purple color in brinjal is anthocyanin. It is a good source of vitamin B. The seed weight here is about 200 grams per hectare. One of the more important varieties, the popular varieties, of, uh, of brinjal are Pusa Purple Long, we have Pusa Samrat, we have Pusa Bhairav. This Pusa Samrat and Pusa Bhairav is resistant or tolerant towards this formopsis blight and a bacterial growth resistant, right? And Pusa Rituraj as well as Arca Keshav is also another variety of brinjal. So fruit and shoot borer, this is one of the most important pests of brinjal. Just call, uh, the, the scientific name of this fruit and shoot borer is Lucinus orbonalis and it causes a dead heart. Here in this picture, I've given the symptom of how a dead heart or a fruit and shoot borer will attack the brinjal. So basically, uh, it causes a dead heart mostly in the younger plants or the youngster, right? So the dead heart here, they would, uh, the fruit or the shoot borer the larva actually will eat up the fruits and it can it will attack it will go inside the fruit and once you cut it open you'll see the larva inside so this is a most common um, pest in brinjal and it also causes it uh, in certain cases it can also eat up all the leaves as well as it can also get into get inside the stems as well mostly here in the newly formed nodes or newly formed buds if you take it out open then you're going to see the larva inside all right and we have um this little leaf of brinjal it is caused due to phytoplasma and it is transmitted by leaf hoppers okay remember that and we're going to go to our chili chili Capsicum species belongs to the family Solanaceae, and the red color in chili is caused due to capsaicin, right? And it also it's also responsible for its um, mass regency. So India is the largest producer of chilies, remember? And capsicum annum is a scientific name for sweet pepper or bell pepper. 
So for a fruit drop, we use NAA at the rate of about 10 ppm. Andhra Pradesh is an actual pioneer in chili production in India. And the most common disease is or the anthracnose. It is also known as dieback and it's caused due to fungus. The major pests of chilies are thrips and the leaf curl virus. The symptoms are similar to that of tomatoes and these are usually transmitted or the vector is thrips or white flies. So a native family like um, tomatoes, brinjal and cheese, they are mostly sown in the nursery first and then they are sown in the main field. So cold crops, cold crops these are also um, uh, temperate crops I could say. They need a temperature, lower temperature than the tropical crops. Tropical, uh, Crops, right and here the cold crops the ancestors of a cold crop is cold wort or it is also known as the wild cabbage and from where the coal is derived right so of all the cold crops are protogyny uh, protogyny is a condition where um, the female plant or the female flower they mature before the male all right so this is a condition and it is found in all the cold crops so what will come on the cold crops, uh, cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, no coal, kale, all these comes under cold crops, right? And curd rot or soft rot it is caused by Arrhenia carotivora. It is a common disease in cold crops. And the major pest is DBM, which is also known as the diamond back moth, as well as seven lupa. So these two pests are the most important pests of cold crops. White rust or white blisters is also important. It's very common in mustard and it is caused by albigo candida. Self compatibility is common. So, usually, if you are going to ask me what self compatibility is, self compatibility is an ability or it, it is a condition where it prevents self fertilization or and it will give and promotes an outcrossing instead of self fertilizing or inbreeding. So this is a condition in Nebraska or the cold crops. It is mostly due to sporophytic self incompatibility. And the characteristic flavor of cold crops is due to the presence of this chemical compound, which is known as dimethyl trisulfide. All right. And the cabbage, it has an anti-cancerous property. And the acting compound for this anti-cancer property is indole-3 carbinol. All right. And the fruit type of cabbage is known as siliqua. Cauliflower blanching is done. Blanching is usually done to remove the yellow color or the yellow tint in the cauliflower and to make it more white. So three season varieties are available in cauliflowers. We have your early varieties, mid varieties, as well as the late varieties. So remember to uh, try to remember some of the varieties for each of this category, right? And scooping. Scooping is also done uh, in cauliflower, which is done to remove the central portion of the curd. It is usually done for the early initiation of the lowest stock. So uh, here I've given some of the physiological disorders of cauliflower. The first one here is blindness. It's caused due to the damage in the early stage due to insect frost or the low temperature. And buttoning, it is due to the nitrogen deficiency, hollow stem, excess use of fertilizers especially nitrogen and it can it's caused also due to the deficiency of boron whip tail is due to mold denim deficiencies in acidic soils remember this right and riciness is due to temperature fluctuation or excess of nitrogen and high humidity so chlorosis it is due to the magnesium deficiency and browning is due to boron deficiency so remember these Deficiency symptoms, it's important to remember all of this and uh, the symptoms as well as the causes. So moving on, we're going to talk on something on floriculture now. The leading flower and flower product exporting country is Netherlands. The important state having the maximum production under floriculture in India is Tamil Nadu. Maximum area is Karnataka. We have maximum cut flower production which is in West Bengal and the maximum flower which covers the maximum area in India is jasmine okay so the Japanese flower arrangement is known as Kavena so these are I just highlighted some of the points which are important in the floriculture perspective and so I'm just I've just started it down here right 
and India is the largest producer of leaf flower in the world. Right, so here in this picture, I've actually given it two pictures. The first one is on a cut flower, and here the second one is on a loose flower. So, if you're going to ask me the difference between a cut flower and a loose flower, so in the cut flower, we usually use it for the arrangement or uh, we usually cut it from the bottom of the stem along with the stem, and it's usually used in the flower arrangement of a bouquet, right. And within the loose flowers, it's mostly uh, we mostly use loose flowers for in the marigold. As you can see, we can use it for garland making. So India, uh, remember this: India is a producer of loose, largest producer of loose flowers, but not the cut flowers, all right? And rose is also known as the queen of flowers. Okay, so we're gonna go along with the uh, plantation crops. And uh, one of my previous videos, I've already discussed on something on plantation crops. So today we're just gonna discuss roughly on some of the crops which comes under plantation crops, right? So queen of beverage. There are two types of tea, Camellia sinensis, and we have Camellia sanica. So Camellia sinensis is Chinese tea. Here the picture I've given of a Chinese tea here, and the Assam tea here is. And the second picture is of an Assam tea. So Camellia sanica is the scientific name of Assam tea, and they belong to the family of called PAC, right? So it's an evergreen shrub, right, for Chinese tea, whereas it's a tree for Assam tea. It's a calcifuge crop, rain fed crop. It was first introduced to India by Mr. Robert Kaid. China is the largest producer of tea, which is followed by India. This is an important point. And the responsible for the color of the, the compound or the chemical compound, which is responsible for the color of tea is theoflavins or Theobigens, right? And the propagation is done by single node cutting, skiffing, it is the lightest pruning, whereas collar pruning is the heaviest pruning. The centering training method is the uh, training method which is used in tea, and we have the best stage for plucking stage or the harvesting stage is two leaves and a bud. So this is one of the most tedious work all of crop production for the tea. So here in this picture, perfect stage for the harvesting of the tea. So it's the two leaf stage along with one bud. As you can see here, the bud is here. So the, this is the best stage. The fermented tea tool, it contains about 55 to 60% moisture. Whereas the made tea contains only about 25 to 3% moisture. Okay, so we're going to talk on coffee now. So coffee, the important points on coffee, I have just highlighted out here. It is the second most important commodity in the world, which comes after petroleum products. Okay, and again, it, ha it has three types. Uh, first one is coffee arabica, also known as arabica coffee. We have coffee sinephora, which is also known as robusta coffee, and coffee bangalensis, which is also a wild coffee and this are mostly this coffee arabica is mostly grown in the higher elevations whereas this coffee cinephora which is also known as a robustite grown in the lower elevation and this uh these are a cross-pollinated crop whereas this coffee arabica is a self-pollinated crop right and arabica as i've already mentioned here high elevation robust and low elevation propagated through seed and vegetative methods right so shading regulation is done in a very common intercultural operation which is done in coffee it is done before the onset of the month so we usually cut uh when you see a coffee coffee usually incorporate it's usually incorporated uh, with the shading as well so it's usually a uh, shading regulation is done or where we just chop off or prune the trees before the onset of monsoon where the sun availability is lesser than the normal days the training system here is single stem system and multiple system pruning and coffee by pruning old productive wood is removed thereby encouraging the growth of the new branches and these new branches can be used in the next year for the cropping right so we have different types of pruning we have light pruning which is after the harvest medium to severe pruning which is done once in four years and the systems of pruning are centering, desuffering, handling, and nipping, right? So stomping or collar pruning, these are done mostly to rejuvenate the badly damaged bushes during the shade regulation or due to the irregular pruning. And the leaf spot and white stem borer, these are the most important diseases and pests of coffee, remember this. 
and it is a short deep blend. And so a topping um, practiced in that coffee processing. Okay, so that's all about coffee, all right? And let's move to our another uh, crop, which is coconut. It's also known as king of spices. Remember the name other names for all these crops, all right? So questions can come on any of these. So king of spice, it's also known as tree of heaven. It's also known as kalpa vriksha and tree of life. The scientific name is Crocus nucifera. It belongs to the family Aracaceae. It is a humid tropical perennial monoecious plant. Remember that. It is of a monotypic genus. It means that it doesn't have any other species other than coconut nucifera. Right? So it's a heliophile plant. It is propagated through mm. seedlings. And remember, India ranks third after Indonesia, making Indonesia the top producing country in the world. For coconut which is followed by philippines and then is followed by india so the coconut oil it contains lauric acid and the choir is obtained from a meso herb right and so this usually this choir or every all these are used as a media right so here milling copra it is common in south india whereas cup copra is famous in the north india all right so uh, let's go to our plantation crops all right, so here in this picture, I've just uh, roughly given on the uh, some of the important plantation crops. All right, so oil-eating crops, we have coconut, we've already discussed on coconut. We have oil palm and we have palmyra. Palmyra is also, is also known as a tree of life and it is the state tree of Tamil Nadu. And erica nut, erica nut, it is, also, uh, it is also known as beetle nut. So the scientific name is Erica Kadachu and India is the highest producer and consumer of Erica nut. So we have beverage crops like tea, coffee, cocoa, known as the food of God. It's native to South America, especially in the Amazon regions, right? So it is basically, it'll be needing about a hot tropical humid climate and uh, it is a shade living tree. Moving on to the nut crops, we have cashew nut. Cashew nut is also known as the gold mine of wasteland, right? So it's very sensitive to water logging, remember that, and um, it's native to Brazil. And we have the last one here, which is rubber. Rubber is uh, very important, uh, that it is tree. Let me just write it down here. This was commercially cultivated in India around the year of 1902, all right? And the, there are usually five, four types of rubber. The first one is Sarah rubber, Indian rubber, Panama, and Gale. Let me just write it Sarah rubber, we yeah, have Panama, Indian. So these are the four types of rubbers. And the most important thing here is that there's a method, there's a budding method called as the forked method, which is used for propagation of this rubber. Okay, so let's go to our last topic here. It's on post-harvest technology. And uh, let us understand these words or terms before. So what is a harvest? A harvest is a, it is a specific and single deliberate action to separate the food stuff with or without non-edible portion from its growth medium. Some of the examples of this harvest would be plucking, all right, of fruits and vegetables, reaping of cereals, or lifting of fish from the water. These are all known as harvest. Whereas the post-harvest, it comes after the harvest and these are all the succeeding actions which comes after harvest are defined as the post-harvest techni techniques. From this period of time, all actions is enter the process of preparation for final consumption, right? So some of the ex examples for this post-harvest methods or techniques would be the pre-cooling, waxing, cleaning, washing, trimming, sorting, curing, transportation, grading storage, ripening, and distribution. So all these techniques will come under your post-harvest techniques, all right? So let us understand what a post-harvest technology is. A post-harvest technology, it is an interdisciplinary science and technique applied to horticultural or agricultural products after harvest for its protection, conservation, processing, packaging, distribution, marketing, and utilization to meet the food and nutritional requirements of the people in relation to their needs. Till the part of time we're gonna it's gonna suppose that the fruit is cultivated from right from the harvest till the processing till all the distribution packaging conservation protection all this method will come under your post harvest technology till the 
final consumption of these products, all right? All right, so there are basic conditions for the post-harvest treatment. The first, there are usually two conditions. The first one here is only the fresh produce can be preserved, remember this? And the second one here is produce should be free from defects. It means that it should not be um, mechanically injured or it should not be it should not be infected with diseases or insect or any type of physiological disorders. I've just jotted down some of the treatments or the post-harvest treatments in handling and storage of horticulture commodities. First one here is on pre-cooling. Pre-cooling is usually done to remove the field heat. So right after harvest, the field heat is still there. So to remove that field heat, we usually uh, put this fruits and vegetables to grow on, which is fruit pre-cooling, where they will be subjected to a low temperature below freezing point or chilling in uh, chilling temperature, all right, for a certain amount of period of time. So this is mostly done to avoid the heat, as heat helps in um, reduces actually heat help reduces in the shelf life of the fruits and vegetables. So to do that, to, to extend the shelf life, we do this process called pre-cooling, right? So after that, we're going to do cleaning and washing. Cleaning and washing, we usually do it to remove all the debris and to clean the uh, fruits and vegetables. It can be usually done by the, with the help of free solutions or free chemicals. Some of them would be your calcium hydroxide, and we have sodium metal bisulfide, right? So these are mostly used for cleaning of these fruits and vegetables. As well as we have the different types of cleaning methods. We have the dry cleaning method where we just clean the fruit or the vegetable with the help of a brush. And we have the dressing, we have the trimming where you remove the unwanted or the uh, removal of the unwanted part of the portion, right? And here, the third method here is sorting, grading, or sizing. Sorting, it is usually done by hand to remove the unwanted um, unwanted fruits or the vegetables which are unwanted for the market and for the storage, okay? So these may be the sorting. Uh, what will be removed during the sorting is we'll be remo removing all the mechanically injured crop, uh, fruits or vegetables or we we'll be removing the ones that are infected with diseases and pests, all right? And so grading, grading is usually done to do the, uh, according to the size, the shape, the color, uh, the firmness, the cleanliness, uh, the diseases, right? So accordingly to that, we're going to grade the, or subject all these uh, fruits or the vegetables into a particular uh, grades or different classes, right? And height, uh, we have a percent. Treatment calls high temperature. Under this, we have a drying method, dipping method, vapor heat treatment. So in drying method, drying method is mostly common in this root and tuber process. We do the process called this cubing. And in dipping, dipping we usually, we usually just dip the fruits or the vegetables inside of hot water. In vapor heat treatment, we usually use the saturated air with uh, particles, with water particles, and it's usually done in a temperature of uh, 40 to 50 degree. Celsius, and this is the particular temperature for this uh, 40 to 50 degree Celsius is particular temperature for this vapor heat treatment, and it is usually done to kill the larvae or the eggs which are present during the quarantine method, right before the shipment or the storage, right? So, and we have some chemical treatments. Chemicals uh, are used, uh, such as disinfectants, are also used during this chemical treatment method, right? So, we have another call, another technique called fruit coating. In a fruit coating, um, or it is also known as waxing. So it is a uh, it is a process where the edible coat or edible cover is put around is covered around the fruit or the vegetable so that they won't be ha having any transpiration losses and it will reduce the respiration rate of its fruits to in order to enhance its shelf life, right? And for fruit, uh, we have astringency removal. Uh, if you're going to ask me what an astringency is, astringency is that chemical compound which gives out this bitterness. And for astringency, we can also use like 4% carbon dioxide as well as we can use an ethanol. So for irradiation, irradiation method, we mostly subject this uh, fruits or vegetables under this uh, gamma rays or x-rays can also be used. In regulation of the ripening, we just uh, regulate the 
the amount of concentration of these ethylenes. So we do this ethylene scavenging as well as we do this degreening, right? And pulsing and tinting. Pulsing and tinting are mostly common in the floriculture area, for flowers especially, yeah, where usually you give the sucrose, we give the super solution in the transpiration in the transpiration uh, stream, right? And it can uh, in floriculture there are also another um, few chemicals known as silver thiosulfate. So these are the two common uh, agents or the compounds or the chemicals which are mostly used for the pulsing of flower products, right? And uh, tinting, tinting is all usually done to enhance the color, right? So there are two types. The dye is there whether you just dip the stem of the flowers on the dye solution which will increase its color or either you can just dip the flowers directly on the dye, right? So we have a light processing, minimal of the light processing as well and we have cold storage, we've already discussed on cold storage way before and packaging, packaging is the last step where you properly pack the uh, fruits and commodities before it goes to the market, right? So uh, there are different types of food preservations, right? So the first one here is canning. Canning is usually done uh, for fruits. It's usually done at a temperature of 100 degrees Celsius. And for vegetables, it is mostly done at 115 to 121 degrees Celsius, all right? So these are usually done at the pr or processed at its temperature. So 100 degrees Celsius for fruits, whereas uh, for vegetables, it is... 115 to 121 degrees Celsius. And pasteurization, or uh, it is a process where we heat the fruits and the vegetable uh, juice at a temperature of 85 to 90 degrees Celsius for usually 30 minutes. So remember one thing about pasteurization, it doesn't kill the, uh, the, the fruit or the vegetables, but instead it kills the microbes which is present. So it is done, it is most kind of like a sterilization method, right? And sterilization, we just heat the fruits and the vegetables uh, at a temperature above 100 degrees Celsius, which will kill the beneficial as well as uh, harmful microbes. So remember, pasteurization kills only the beneficial, uh, the harmful microbes, whereas sterilization can also kill the beneficial as well as the harmful microbes. Right. So freezing, freezing is done at a cooler storage for about 15 degrees Celsius. Right, and it can refrigerate it or chilling can be done at about um, zero to five degrees Celsius. Right, so cryopreservation we've already talked about cryopreservation where we use a liquid nitrogen at a temperature of minus 196 degrees Celsius. Right, so here we use a liquid nitrogen. And for drying, drying is mostly done to remove the moisture content in the uh, fruits or the vegetables can be done either way it can be done uh, through uh, sun drying as well as a regulated drying all right and we have preservation through osmosis example of this would be in your jam or jelly where you just put the sugar all right and through salt preservation as well right so these are the two methods used in the osmosis for preservation so by chemicals we have KMS which is also known as potassium metabisulfite and we have sodium benzoate these are the chemicals which are mostly used for the preservation of fruits and vegetables and another method here is known as fermentation a perfect example for fer fermentation would be your wine all right alcohol will be produced say about from 7 to 20 percent so in this way it can be stored for a longer long period of time right? so a sepsis a sepsis is the process of entry of the microbes inside the fruit or the vegetables. So, and these, uh, other than that, we have antioxidants such as ascorbic acid, which will prevent oxidation of these fruits and vegetables. And then lastly, blanching, which is most common in cauliflower, which is uh, most common in cauliflower, especially, especially in vegetables, which is, which is where we just subject it to a boiling water for two to five minutes, all right? And after that, we will be making it cool. So it is mostly done to prevent the browning of the plant. So these are some of the preservation methods or for this thing, right? But that's all for today. Um, thank you so much. I hope you liked the session. And if you guys have any doubts or if you guys have any questions, please don't forget to comment in the comment section and please let me know. And if you've liked the video, please don't forget to hit the like button as well as share with your friends for the further notifications.